all the children. I want to be a part of the kids program. You'll follow my wife and uh, daughter out the door from ages four years old up to fourth grade. All the rest of us are turning to Malachi chapter 3. We're going to finish up tonight the book of Malachi. How about that? Lord willing. And uh, I hope you had a good day today. Uh, man, we had a great day. It was wonderful out today. And Pastor brought us over to that Mediterranean restaurant. I know there's a lot of them. And he wanted me to drink that turkey coffee. And I don't know about that. I told him I'm not going to do it because I want to go to sleep tonight. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that thing just looked a little too potent for me. But my wife, she'll drink it. She loves strong coffee. Pastor and my wife drank it down. And I said, well, you guys can uh, call each other at 2 in the morning. How about that, all right? You can t check on each other as you're going there. So just want to say, Pastor, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful uh, week of being here. I just love coming back. It's just a great time of fellowshipping with you folks. You've been so fair. How many of you, how many of you have been here every single time the door's been open? Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. How many, every but one? You only missed one. Good, good, good. I tell you what, Pastor, that's just a, that's a sign of a growing church. Can I tell you that? That's a good thing. Good thing. And so thank you for being there and and uh, just thank you for your generosity and hospitality for our family. You've been so gracious to us. And hopefully we've been a blessing to you. We try to do that as we travel the country. And uh, I had a neat uh, adventure. Pastor Josh, you'll like this. Teddy came to me. We were at the homestead. And he said, hey, Brother Jake, can I ride with you? I said, oh, yeah, Teddy, come on. And so Teddy got in the back of the van. He sat right behind me. I was driving the church van. We pull into the driveway. And he says, hey, Brother Jake. You're bald. I said, what? He said, I'm just noticing something. You're bald. I said, well, Teddy, I got some bad news to tell you. When I was five years old, five years old I have a picture of me playing on a playground, and guess what I had? I had a full head of blonde hair. I said, 45 years later, you know what happened? This. I said, you better be careful, son. That hair of yours may go bye-bye. But we're just having a great time this week with Teddy. Man, we really have. And really all the kids, we've just enjoyed bringing with them and being on the, the place over there. And it's just been a great delight. Well, we're in the book of Malachi, and we're really looking at what it takes to truly change. I was telling Dale this the other night. I said, you know, these principles that we've given to you aren't a one-and-done set of principles. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, hey, I'm going to change the way I think about God, and I've only got to do this one time, and I'm good to go. No, 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 no. It's principles that I have to check on myself daily, sometimes hourly. Okay, and so what happens is I've got to I've got to run through some inventory in my life. Why? Because hey, the devil's trying to deceive me at all kinds of different times. Sometimes it's in this angle, and sometimes it's it's at that angle. And so if I'm not running through this list in my mind consistently, can I tell you? Sometimes I just miss a spot. You know what I'm talking about? And so the chapter one kind of taught us that we've got to have, we've got to change the way we think about God. And boy, I tell you what, it's so convicting. I said it earlier. This is one of the most convicting books in the Bible to me. Why? Because I know how easy it is, Pastor, to be a creature of habit and skip the devotion. Why? I'm doing it. What other people see me doing it, that's good enough. But then we get into the Word of God and we found that God says, no, 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 no. He said the church of Ephesus, nevertheless, I got someone against you. What in the world could you have against you? You left your first love. There's no commitment to. And, and it doesn't work in marriage. And it doesn't work with your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And so he says you've got to have that devotion and discipline. And that makes a proper relationship. And so he teaches us that in that chapter 1. Then we look at chapter 2, and boy, I tell you what, we can, we can analyze it all we want, but it's just flat-out convicting. Why? Because how many times have we told God no? I've told God no. I don't like to say that I've told God no, but it's happened. 
And what happens is, is when we tell God no, can I tell you it this way? We decide we don't need the umbrella. You'll never forget that. Why? Because when it was told to me, I never forgot it. It makes perfect sense that when I try to live outside of God's covenant, what he has given to me of how I should live, I am not going to have, I'm not going to enjoy life in peace. And can I tell you, that is true for any human, whether it's a saved person or a lost person. It doesn't matter. When you live outside the covenant of God, you are going to struggle. And what's so sad, Pastor, is we got some people that have struggled so long and, for, and had such a difficult time, they've given up on God. And they said, you know what, if that's the God thing, if that's what God's going to do to me, by the way, God didn't do that to you. You chose that. You chose not to put the umbrella up, okay? God's telling you, put the umbrella up. And we say, no, I'm just going to pick and choose the, what I want to do. And God says, okay, I'll let you do it. But listen, is that what I wanted for you? And so he says, hey, there's life and peace under that. And then we looked at chapter 3. And we said, really, you've got to change the way you value God. And boy, the children of Israel have gotten to this place, haven't they? Where they say, it is vain to serve the Lord. What profit is it? I mean, honestly, what profit could there possibly be to serve the Lord? And here is the problem with that, okay? When we don't have the proper value of God in our life, we start investing in ourselves, get this, in order to obtain value from others. And can I tell you, that is a vicious cycle that will never end in satisfaction. And I gave you all the illustration of me working on my house and spending gobs of time, more time than any other particular project in the house, and no one has ever come by and said one thing about it. And all I was doing, watch, is I wanted people to tell me how awesome I was, okay, because of this project, and it never happened. And that's exactly what we do. We run into this vicious cycle, and you know what we'll do? We'll spend our whole entire lives trying and trying and trying and trying to find satisfaction from the praise of others. And then you come to the word of God and you find out, hey, it'll never happen. You will only be complete in Christ. So if that's true, that means my satisfaction can't be in my ability and my disabilities or my lack of ability. It's only in Christ. You say, well, preacher, what are we going to do now? Look at the next verse. Look with me in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Look with me in verse number 16. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake. Well, stop, stop, stop. See, when you have the proper view, value of God, you know what kind of people you are? You're people that fear the Lord. Now, I know that Ecclesiastes, you guys are studying something like that, all right? All right? I don't know if you've gotten to that last chapter yet, but, but you're going to get there, okay? That's the end of the book, okay? But a person that has the proper value of God fears God. You say, well, preacher, how can I have the proper value of God? I was talking to Dale after the service last night, and I said, Dale, now listen, this is how you obtain the proper value of God. You have to, watch this, understand who God is. How many of you, how many of you are antiquers? How many of you are antiquers? Anybody here, you like, you like antiques? You like going to antique shopping? Well, my wife and I, 
We are antiquers. You say, you don't look like an antiquer. I am like a transplant antiquer, okay? I wasn't ever an antiquer, but I got married to one. You know how it goes? And so we travel the country. And so you know how it goes because we travel the country. Our home is built in 1874. We kind of like old things, all right? We like that. And so my wife is into dishes. Now, I don't know if you ladies are into dishes, but my wife is all into China, all right? And uh, so the, we go, we go to different antique stores, yard sales, estate sales, and we're always looking. Now, Pastor, I know my wife's dishes. She's got Johnson Brothers. You ladies are going to be impressed, okay? <laughs> Finlandia, okay? And then she's got the Heritage False Craft set that we use every day, all right? Now, the rule is, Pastor, you cannot buy another set of dishes until these dishes are gone. You know, see what I'm saying? Amen. Okay? Because we've already got... Amen. Again. <laughs> Amen. Pastor, she's sitting about seven rows behind you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyways, uh, so the rule is you can't go out and buy any more dishes till we either give a set away or we're done with that set. You know, we're like, okay, that set's done, and we want a new set. So, Pastor Josh, this is what it is. We split up. This is like a secret ops mission, okay? We'll go into an antique store, and my wife will go right, and I'll go left. Now, the gig is who can find a piece, because you never find a full set, okay? That's just not how it works, okay? But who can find a piece of one of those three sets is the winner. And so, man, I tell you what, we're on it. She goes right, I go left, and boy, we're on it. We, we probably look like the funniest looking people on the planet, okay? Because we're like looking in all the crannies, we're looking. And listen, then it is, what kind of money do they want for it? And sometimes, Pastor, you know what I find? We walk out of there just as if we stole it. Now, we didn't steal it, okay? Don't get me here. All right. But the truth is, they had no clue of the value that those dishes are. And because they had no value of what the dishes are, get it? They were just giving it away. And we were way welcoming it into our home. Why? Because we know the value of them. Hey, can I tell you? If you don't understand who God is, you'll never understand his value. Can I stop? We don't tell you all to come to church because we want to post a number on a sign. Okay? Get that? We don't do that. Pastor Josh doesn't want to say, hey, we had this many people in Sunday school or this many people in Sunday. That is not the reason. Now, there are some pastors that way, but these guys up here are not that way, okay? The reason why we beg and plead with you, hey, come to Sunday school or uh, life classes or come to Sunday morning or come Sunday night or come to win or come to revival. Here's why. Because you will start having a better understanding of who God is. Amen. See, if I tell you, hey, do you know what a Finlandier dish is? Most of you are like, got no clue. No clue. Now watch. You don't know that, but if you knew what it looked like, you would be like, oh, that's what it is. And you would start keeping your eyes. Why? Because you know what this value is, and if you can get a really good deal on it, hey, it's great value. Now watch. If you don't know who God is, because you don't go to church, you know how you can figure out who God is? Read it. See, we don't, we don't tell people at camp, Pastor, uh, Pastor Josh, hey, we want you to do your devos today. We want you to have God and I time today just because we got nothing to do for 30 minutes each morning. It's not that at all. You know what we're trying to do? We're trying to create habits in their lives that every time they get up, they soak themselves into the word of God so they can find who they are and who God is. Because if you don't know who God is, you don't understand the value of him. Now watch. If you think you're going to understand the value just by coming to church one time a week, 
It's going to take you a long, long time. But when you start getting soaked by the scripture and by preaching and by doing your devotions and by praying and being, watch this, around Christians. I don't know how many times this week, pastor, people came up to me and said, hey, brother Jake, I got a question about something. That's what we're supposed to do. Not that we have all the answers. We don't, but the book does. And so watch, when you're around the world, you can't get that. The world is not going to be able to explain to you what the word justification means in Christ. The world's not going to be able to help you understand how to parent according to the word of God. The world's not going to do that. And so we have this wonderful thing called a church and fellowship of believers that we can come together and when we don't understand what to do, there's other people that bend down the road. Matter of fact, today I was with Pastor and his wife and we were having dinner and I was talking to him and I was just asking him a few questions about adult children. How many of you got adult children? Raise your hand. Yeah, isn't that a joy, amen? You know, he's got about 14 of them, you know what I'm saying? It's like... He's got to figure something out by this point, you know. So the truth is, hey, but that's how it works. It's supposed to, he's supposed to have more knowledge than I have. Why? Because he's been down the road. And now get it, I may have more knowledge than you have because your kids are little. Okay? That's how it works. But get that, that's part of the church. That's how we understand God's value. He created the church. And he says, now, when you have the proper value of God in your life, or as, can we go back to verse number 16? Then they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. Can I tell you, I'm going to give you three benefits of you and I having the proper value of God in our life, all right? So obviously, pastor, there was a remnant of people in the children of Israel. That's what we're talking about, all right? There was a remnant that, that would be a small nucleus of people that said this, okay, everybody's going the way of the world in our nation, but listen, we're not. Hey, could that be said of Kendall Park Baptist Church? Could we, could we just make a statement? Hey, everybody's going the way of the world, but praise the Lord, we're going to stand straight and we're going to stand firm on the word of God. Amen. Now watch why that is such a wonderful thing. Because you're going to see some benefits of us having, having the proper value of God. Look at the first one with me. Go ahead, Brother Chris, throw that up on the screen. The first one that God tells us that will be our benefits when we have the proper value of God is because, number one, God will listen to us. Did you see it right there in verse 16? The Bible says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Hey, this is that fellowship. And look what he says. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. So God is willing, get this, to listen to you and to me. Now that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Matter of fact, you know it's stated throughout all the Bible. But turn with me to Psalm chapter 3. Would you go? We're going to peruse through the book of Psalms real fast. And we're going to look at some of these instances in which God gives us this idea that he wants to listen to us. All right, Psalms chapter 3, verse number 4. Look what your Bible says. Look what David says when he's fleeing from Absalom in Psalm chapter 3, verse number 4. He says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. Turn with me to 22, chapter 22, verse 21. A couple pages over, 22, verse 21. Look what your Bible says. It says in Psalm 22, verse 21, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horn of the unicorn. And look with me in chapter 34, verse 4. Chapter 34, verse 4. 
Look what your Bible says in chapter 34, verse 4. He says, I sought the Lord, this is David speaking again, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Chapter 66, verse 19. Chapter 66, verse number 19. Look what your Bible says. Chapter 66, verse number 19. The Bible says, but verily, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Chapter 118, verse 21. Chapter 118, verse number 21. I'm doing this on purpose. Chapter 118, verse 21. Look what your Bible says. It says, I will praise thee. Why? For thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Chapter 120, verse 1. Chapter 120, verse number 1. It says, in my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he, next two words, class. So did you get it? Do you understand what he's saying? When you have the proper view or value of God in your life, or can we say it the way Malachi says it, then they that feared the Lord, the Lord heard. You say, well, preacher, how do we know that for sure? Would you turn with me to John chapter 15? John chapter 15. This is a great passage of scripture when it comes to prayer. John chapter 15, verse number 7. John chapter 15, verse number 7. In this passage, Jesus gives us the beautiful imagery of the vine in the branches. This is verse number 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Now think of it this way. Think of it as, as you got this big trunk, okay? And then you got this, tree, this branch that comes out the side, all right? Think of it that way. Now look at verse number 7. If ye abide in me, oh, this is good. And my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now here's my question. If you have a tree, and it has a branch connected to the tree, whose fruit is it? It's the trees. Why? You cut off that branch, okay, get your chainsaw off, Cut that thing off. Here's my question. Is that blossom going to keep, stay alive? Is it going to produce new blooms? Is it going to produce new limbs? No. So obviously, the only way that branch is going to produce is if it's connected to the vine. Or can we say it this way? The trunk. The main part of the tree. Now this is very interesting. He says, if you abide in me. Can I say it this way? When Christ's spirit has control of your spirit. I was telling Dante, or, uh, I was telling Dante this and Christian. That we often wonder, why is it that we struggle so much in the Christian life? With him having control. Why is it? Why is it always a struggle? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, our Bible says that the spirit and the flesh are at war. Okay? The flesh lusted after the spirit and the spirit after the flesh. And so these two are just going at it. Okay? And, and I said, it, I can explain it this way. According to the word of God, you're made of a trichotomy. Okay? You're three parts. We say, we say, Body, soul, and spirit. But the Bible actually says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it's the spirit, the soul, and the body. Now get that. So we're made up of three parts. The spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, the spirit, according to Ephesians 2 verse 1, is dead to spiritual things. That's why he says, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in your trespasses and spins. This thing, the spirit, is dead. It's dead to things that are spiritual. Well, get this. The spirit controls the soul. What's the soul? That's who you are. Okay? That's your 
That's your personality. That's your desires. That's, that's, that's who, not the, what you see, but who you are inside, okay? And then that soul controls the body. Now watch. When you become a child of God, God's spirit comes in your spirit. Now stop. Just because God's spirit comes into your spirit doesn't mean you're sinless. Why? 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have not sinned, we've deceived ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But isn't it true that my Bible says that we are more than conquerors? So it must mean we can have victory. See, I told Christian, before you were saved, you didn't have a chance. Why? Because your dead spirit which controlled your soul, which controlled your body, wouldn't ever have victory over sin. But when Christ came in, watch this, and he has control. When his spirit has control over your spirit, by the way, that's when Christ is abiding in you. And you abide in him. When Christ's spirit has control of your spirit, which has control over your soul, which has control over your body, guess what you find? Victory. Why? That's exactly what Galatians 5, 16 is all about. Walk in the spirit. Allow God's spirit to have control over your spirit. And you know what the Bible says? And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But here's the problem. The only way his spirit can have control over your spirit is if you die. Now, I'm not talking physical death. I'm saying you got to remind yourself that uh, that old man is dead. That old man's not going to live. Why? Because when you got saved, you attended your own funeral. You didn't know it. But in order for you to be a child of God, you know what had to happen? That old man had to die because that old man was telling you, you know what? You don't need this. Matter of fact, that old man said, you know, you're good enough. You're not that bad. Matter of fact, you do this later. But watch. On January, July 25th, 1985 at 1030 at night, guess what I did? I put that old man to death. Here's why. Because I grew up a preacher's kid. That's why I'm deranged. Okay. But the truth is, I thought I could ride on the shirt, shirt tails of my mom and my daddy. My mom and my daddy had been in ministry, and I thought, you know what? Hey, there's no way God would send me to hell. I'm a preacher's son. And on July 25th, 1985, guess what? I put that old man to death. And I realized it was going to be my sin that drug me to hell. And I didn't want to spend eternity there and get what happened. I said, no, old man, you got to die. And I trusted Jesus Christ. And guess what happened then? His spirit came into my spirit. Now watch. That didn't mean I became sinless. It does not. Why? Because my spirit likes to take over. How about yours? But listen to what your Bible says. Verse number 7. He says, if ye abide in me, ooh, and my words abide in you. Can I say it this way? His spirit has control over my spirit. Ye shall ask what ye will. Hey, can I tell you, when his spirit has control over my spirit, Pastor Josh, you know what he does? He asks for what he wants, not what I want. Guess what happens? And it shall be done unto you. Isn't it awesome that we have a God who loves us so much that he'll take the time to listen to us? Praise God for that. That God would want to listen and get it. He not only wants to listen, Pastor, he says he wants to help me. And I find church family, when I understand the proper value of God in my life, my prayer life is powerful. Can I tell you this? If it's true for me, 
I'm a nobody. It'll be true for you. And God wants you to exercise the power of prayer in your life. But I find this, Pastor Josh, when we don't have the proper value of God, we don't pray at all. The only time we pray is out of tradition because that's what we do before we eat. Lord, thank you for this food. Amen. That's it. God says, I know why you're doing that. Because you don't have the proper value of me in your life. But notice the second benefit he wants to give us. Go back with me to Malachi, would you? Malachi. Chapter 3. Look what your Bible says in that verse. He says in verse number 16, he says, Then they that feared the Lord, those that had the proper view, a value of God, spake often one another, and the, the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Now get this. God says he'll not only hear you, he'll listen to us, but get this. Number two, God will remember us. How many of you here have ever forgotten anything? Raise your hand. How many of you here, as you've gotten older, realize forgetfulness seems to be more often of an occurrence too? Yeah, I'm with you. I thought, you know, for a long time, I was one of those guys, I didn't write anything down. I just was one of those guys kind of like, it just rolled up there, you know. And boy, I, I would do this and I would do, I'd go to the job. I wouldn't think about writing anything down. I would just say, oh, yep, we're doing that job. We need this tool, this tool, this tool. We need these supplies. Let's go to the job. And you know what? Most of the time, it wasn't bad. Then I turned 41. I don't know what happened, Pastor. Everything started falling apart at 41 for me. And so you know what happens when you forget something? It takes more time, doesn't it? You got to go back to the shop. You got to pick up the stuff, or you got to go down the road, pick up what you forgot at the grocery store. I know how it goes. And so there's some times in which forgetting is a real bad thing. You say, Preacher, what are you talking about? I only forgot my wife's birthday one time. <laughs> Just one time, okay? And it only took one time, and I figured out I am never, ever going to do that again. So they make these smartphones that have, like, alerts. Praise God for that. Pastor, you be taking notes right now, all right? Go ahead and write that down, all right? And I'm telling you what, because as I get older, it seems a little more difficult to remember everything. But aren't you glad we serve a God who doesn't forget? I love what your Bible says in Matthew chapter 10. He says it this way, that he'll remember that cold glass of water. I love that. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10? I want to show you this verse because it's powerful. It really is. Hebrews chapter 10. Keep your finger here. We'll come back. This is just an extra bonus feature right here. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, my bad. Hebrews 6, 10. That's what it is. Hebrews 6, 10. Here we go. Look what it says. For God is not unrighteous. Oh, man. Isn't that wonderful? If he's not unrighteous, it means he's righteous. Okay? Well, why are we bringing that up? For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of... What's the word, glass? Isn't there times in which... We get a little bit of this pity party going on. You ever been there? Like you did something special for your husband, and he didn't even make mention of it. Now, all you ladies, just be quiet here, okay? Just let me finish. And you just really wanted to say, <coughs> just as loud as you could, like in their hearing aid, amen? Like, didn't you notice what I just did for you? I spent all afternoon, right? And, and it, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's me, it's just a bad feeling. Why? Because you've been forgotten. 
you didn't get any gratitude. It's as if they weren't even thankful for it. They didn't even notice. Aren't you glad we serve a God that says, oh, I love this. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Ah, Pastor, you know, there's times where as we get older, we are limited. I, I, I talk to a lot of retirees, okay? Can't do what we used to do. It's just a fact. That's not mean. It's just how life is. It's going to happen to me too. And so all of us, sometimes we feel like, well, what good am I? Hey, stop, stop. God is a God who remembers. He remembers all your labor, all your work, all your love that you poured into that, that maybe you never got recognized. But let me tell you, good news, good news. <coughs> God remembers. Go back with me to Malachi because I want to show you this last benefit of having the proper value of God in your life. The Bible says in verse 17, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day, when I make up my jewels, I will spare them. As a man spareth his own son that serveth him, then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth them not. All right, number three. What's the third benefit of you having the proper value of God in your life? Oh, he says he'll listen to us. He'll remember us. But get number three. He'll protect us. You know what your Bible says? I'm going to spare them. Now, what's interesting, chapter 4, it's really the future judgment that's going to come down. The day of the Lord. And you know what's interesting about that? God is going to use heat. That's what we find, okay? But isn't it amazing, Pastor? He's going to use heat for torment on those that believe not. And he's going to use heat to comfort those that believe. You say, how's that possible? He's God. How, how can I do that? I have no clue. I'm not as smart as God. But aren't you glad that God has the ability to protect his own? It's amazing. You look out through all of history. You know what you'll find? God was always there and able to protect the remnant. He didn't destroy all of them. Oh, there's times he wanted to, okay? But he didn't. They were spared. They were spared. They were protected. They were protected. They were protected. Can I tell you why they were protected? Here's why. Here's why. Because they had the proper value of God in their life. You say, well, preacher, what if I really don't think it's that big of a deal? A few years ago, I was at a conference, and I, I heard an evangelist by the name of Glenn Matthews. Has anyone here ever heard of evangelist Glenn Matthews? Have you? Well, evangelist Glenn Matthews, have you heard of evangelist Glenn? Evangelist Glenn Matthews is out of North Carolina, and he is like 92, 93 years old. He's probably about 95 years old. Been in evangelism for like 70 years. So he had a breakout session, Pastor Josh, and I thought, hey, anyone that's been in it that long has got to have something to say that's worth listening to. So here comes this old man. He's creaking up here to the pulpit area. And I mean, this is a conference of like six, seven hundred just men. And he's, he's kind of making his way up to the, uh, the platform, and he finally gets up there, and he's got this old raspy voice. And he said to us, guys, he said, what's the worst thing that can happen to a Christian on this earth? So, you know, as a preacher, you start rolling that thing. Okay, let's see this and this and this. And he said it again. 
one more time. What's the worst thing that could happen to a Christian on this earth? And so, Pastor, I was trying to come up with all these theological uh, things that could happen that could be the worst thing. Then he said this. He said, God becomes silent to you. And I thought to myself, oh my, he nailed it. You know what's interesting about this book? This is the last book of the Old Testament. From this book, this is the last revelation that God gave for 400 years to the New Testament, the birth of Christ. 400 years of silence. Candace, I thought about this today. How many people did that affect? How many kids grew up? Because one group of people said, nah, I'm not going to return back to him. I'm going to keep going this way. How many moms did that affect? How many dads did that affect? How many generations would never hear from the voice of God? Because one group of people said, I'm not returning. And God was silent for 400 years. See, Pastor, we come into services like this and we think, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Really? When God becomes silent, it's a huge deal because you can't make it. You can't do it on your own. And if you think you can, that's the problem. You've not returned back. But how many people, let me get more personal, how many generations in your home do you want God to be silent to? Simply because we're not willing to turn back, to truly change. Because we already saw what God wants to do. But we have to change the way we think about God. We've got to change the way we obey God. And we've got to change the way we value God. Would you bow with me? Every head that bowed, every eye closed here tonight.